And a very pleasant good evening. I'm Charles Carter. The 1960s have been called a decade of change, and certainly the world did change in the 60s. So did the Bahamas. By the end of 1969, man had walked on the moon. By the end of 1969, the group, the beginning of the end, came out of their own hibernation and created a sound that was heard around the world. That sound is called Funky Nassau, and it's still the most popular Bahamian song that has ever been created. It's my pleasure to introduce Ray Munnings, who was not only the youngest member of that group, but also the vocalist and keyboardist and the author of the song, along with your cousin, Dr. Off. And that was an exciting period. Well, thank you for having me, Charles. And um, that introduction, like I said, is, speaks volumes because, like I said, the 60s was really an exciting time for me, too. You know, I had graduated from St. John's College at uh, 18 or so around 1966. And uh, we had a group in college, uh, well, in high school, called the Vibrations. Of course, that was uh, Ozzy Brown on drums, Asmo Bo vocals, uh, Robert Smith on guitar, and I played keyboards. And that was the band. And every, every weekend, we would um, try to have a little get-together with the band and, and just go out and play little parties here and there. And that set the stage for what was to come, like you said, in, in the later 60s. But that was mid-60s when we started actually performing out to the, to the Bahamian public. Was it always a given to you, Ray, that you would follow into your father's footsteps, the legendary Freddie Munnings, and become a musician? Did you always want it to become an entertainer? Well, Charles, it goes back to I was about four years old, back in the Silver Slipper. And uh, one time uh, I used to go to matinee dances with my father, and he said um, he came on stage dressed one time as Santa Claus in a red suit and everything, and brought me this big tricycle uh, right on the stage. I was able to ride it around on the stage and stuff like that. And he told me he wanted me to sing. So I went to the microphone. Lil G at the time, Harold McNair, in his band had a song called Dig Beat, Take Me to Nassau. And they gave me a microphone, and they stand me up in the chair, and people start to throw money, and the rest is history. I said, <laughs> if it's that easy to make some money, I, I think I'm going to hold on to this for a while. But yes, you know, and it's very hard being uh, the son of someone as famous as, uh, as popular as my father was at the time, uh, although I never tried to compete or compare with him, but uh, being exposed to all of that entertainment is what made it really easy for me to just naturally uh, gravitate towards the entertainment and the nightclub business. Your father, Freddie Munnings, was one of the most outstanding men of the 20th century Bahamas. Mm -hmm. For more reasons than one, but let's just talk about the entertainment empire that you were born into, mm -hmm. the empire that he created. Everybody remembers Freddie and the Cat. Now, the Cat and Fiddle was one of the most amazing nightclubs of all time. Right. First of all, it was an outdoor room. And secondly, it, it had a show every night. Thirdly, some of the world's greatest personalities performed at that show. Exactly. You grew up in the Cat and Fiddle, didn't you? Yes. Um, like I said, it started first at the Silver Slip on, <clears throat> on uh, East Street. And uh, once he, uh, my father moved to the Cat and Fiddle, it was the mid-50s. And the same thing started happening there. Like I said, it just went from strength to strength. Uh, being exposed to these artists, like uh, the likes of, he, he said to me, uh, FM Senior said to me one time, uh, you know, you got to remember, no matter how great you are as an entertainer, you have a price tag. So he, one time, uh, Sam Cooke was there, and he said to me, I want you to pay Sam Cooke. So you can realize that no matter how, like I said, how, how great how the performer are. Are, yeah. uh, they are, you just, uh, when it's time for payday, if you can hire them, and then you make the bulk of the money because you charge admission to get in. And so I saw the way that worked, And uh, but I, I liked the performing on stage part. That was the part that really, at that point, I was interested in. Well, performing on stage with your father was some of the finest local Bahamian musicians and entertainers. Who do you remember for those times? Well, going back, uh, 
Of course, like I said, the 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 the, the first person that uh, comes to mind is Lil G at the time. Like I said, he had yeah. the song "Take Me, Take Me to Nassau." He had uh, one of the finest trumpet sections in 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 the whole, uh, which of course incorporated not only Bahamians, but it, from people from the West Indies, from from the United States, people from uh, Europe, and it really uh, it, it made me realize that. You just don't have to concentrate or everybody's got to be Bahamian. Mm -hmm. You can, uh, you know what I mean? You need to incorporate all of these different uh, cultures to really get get yourself a, a, a good, solid, solid, rounded band. And like I said, he had one-time strings in the yes. band. He had, uh, of course, uh, like I said, um, uh, other female singers that would come in at certain times. But the... But uh, all I the think Mac started there. McNair was, yeah. was, was the yeah. one that... Harold McNair, did Harold McNair, yeah. But I mean, I mean, so many Bahamian artists go oh, yeah. back to the cat and fiddle because your dad, not only in teaching you, he also mm -hmm. taught other entertainers how to become entertainers, other musicians how to become musicians. Mm -hmm. And of course, you had uh, this fantastic floor show. Mm -hmm. This floor show that you have to go to Las Vegas nowadays to see, but that happened every night at the cat and fiddle. And, well... You know, uh, very quickly, Charles, like I said, because this, <clears throat> this is going to be recorded for history. history. Uh, the floor show actually got its name because the show was performed down on the dance floor. And uh, the Cat and Fiddle, of course, when it first opened, didn't have a stage. So that's, that's one of the reasons they also called it a floor show. And then once uh, FM built the stage, uh, they still call it a floor show, but it, it was elevated to about four or five feet. And uh, when you when you talk about a show that, although the inter international artists would come in, the Bahamians enjoyed the, the local native show just as much, as well as the tourists just as much or more than they even did seeing Nat King Cole and all these other people. And so uh, you would always, no matter who the, the the main attraction was, the native show would come on first. So yeah. you'd have to you'd have to be exposed to that. And uh, I think, uh, like you say, at the time, uh, it had a cast of dancers and uh, about at least 35 or 40 people. Working the every dancers, night, that's right. Dancers Great and, dance and line. Uh, I remember when Shirley Hall Bass came in and mm -hmm. she bought that bunch of gorgeous, yeah. leggy American dolls called Vashinets. the Vashinettes. But I remember the behemoths like uh, ah, Fireball Freddy. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Lil Dudley. Lil Dudley, Dudley Caproni. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when he became famous, he, he stopped being a cape when he became a Caproni. That's you right. know, like Delamore st <laughs> he stopped being, stopped being uh, De stubs. <laughs> he became Delamore. You know, Delamore. And Delamore. Uh, and that's three. exactly right. And of course, great female male dancers and male dancers there who, right. who were there as, as well. We can't leave out the, the dancing waiters. That's, That's right. Cy Roberts and, and Skaboo Newton. That's right. Like I said, they, these, they started a, a trend that, that this, uh, like I said. George Burroughs and Lucille Adley, That's who's right. famous mama doing Freeport nowadays. And all of those uh, individuals came out of the, the belly of the cat and fiddle. And like you say, some of them are still alive today uh, and, and going on and continuing their careers. But Most of them who are alive today turn Christian. Is there anything mm -hmm. happening there? <laughs> well, Charles, I don't know if you noticed a trend, too. Most places that used to be very popular clubs turned into churches in the last <laughs> 10, 15 years. If you, you, I mean, I don't want to call any names, but you can check it, check it out. I noticed that happen. The banana butter is a prime <laughs> example. But in international stardom, the one thing that the Cat and Fiddle had too, besides this world-class native show, you could find the best acts of the 50s, 60s, and 70s in the Cat and Fiddle. Mm -hmm. People like Nat King Cole, Sam Cooke, Otis Redding, Benny King, The Drifters. It just goes on and on and on and on. And that was fabulous. That must have been a great place for you to be able to walk in free. Well, not only walking free, but like I said, to be exposed up close, one-on-one -on -one to all the artists. A very quick story, like I said, Curtis Mayfield was one of, of my favorite uh, entertainers, performers at the time, musicians. And uh, the vibrations actually patterned, uh, we patterned ourselves after uh, the, the um, impressions. And uh, one day we came from uh, St. John's, it was lunchtime. Uh, and, and they had their instruments on the stage because they had just uh, got through rehearsing. And so 
uh, I told my to get up there at the time, Smitty, Robert Smith. I said, man, this this kid is up, let's plug in, let's play. Maybe you'll be able to play, sound like him playing. So he did that, and something went wrong with the amplifier. So I said, oh, look, it's time to go, man. We, so I didn't, I didn't tell the old man what had happened. So I could imagine that night when, and well, Curtis is passed now, God rest the dead. So it, it's too late, but it, uh, I'm sure they, they didn't get it to work that night because something went wrong when we were, when we were uh, playing around with it. And like I said, that kind of up close personal, or to be able to, after Nat King Cole had finished playing uh, uh, or rehearsing, you know, I was able to go and play the piano right a couple of minutes after that. Things like that, that, that you can't, money, you can't, you can't buy that it. That would money, stick in you your know? mind forever, but I can't let this moment pass in talking about the Captain Phillips shows, not bring up the fact mm -hmm. that the only time the Ice Follies performed in the Bahamas was at the Captain Fiddle. Well, that's right. You know, that old man was saying that, uh, I'll, I'll call him the old man now, he never liked that, but he was saying that, people were saying it couldn't be done. I mean, how could you freeze a 40-foot uh, uh, ice pack out in the tropics? I mean, because the, 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 the club was completely open. It wasn't enclosed, so you couldn't have air conditioning. And they did it. And like I said, it was, it, it was a very big hit because uh, as the locals as well as people coming from the States were, would marvel at how could you get this stage frozen and it, it's outdoor. You know. Your father, though, was a very meticulous mm -hmm. musician. Oh, yeah. Now, there are a lot of Munnings who followed him, mm -hmm. but no one has been as meticulous as he, except maybe for Ralph, well, in trying to become the best musician that he could be. Well, well like you said, not, not just meticulous, but he loved music to the, to the point where he never felt that he, he knew enough. He just wanted to keep learning more and more to the point where he said once that he was already the most popular uh, entertainer in the Bahamas at the time, but he felt he needed to improve his writing and arranging ability, and he also needed to get into um, a situation where uh, Eric Cash, yes. my godfather, yes. would come twice a week and they would do studies, uh, I mean, again, on, on harmony and theory and, and going, you know, going through music as like it was a science, yes. you know. And so, like I said, he was never satisfied with just being popular as a musician. He wanted to improve himself and to continue to learn. Much improved as a vocalist as well. I mean, people forget how good a voice he had. I mean, mm -hmm. the Perry Como of the Bahamas, I uh, remember distinctly. Well, they, they called them at the time the crooners. He was one yes. of the original crooners. Yes. And uh, like, just touch very quickly on the, the education side again. Again, being at the time one of the most popular artists in the country, he decided he was going to go to Boston, to the conservatory, to study even more. And it wasn't necessary because, like, he was making money, you know, hand mm -hmm. over fist. Mm -hmm. And he took two years off to go up there and further his studies. And then when he came back, I don't know how he, he could do it, but he could lie in bed with a pencil and write music on, on, a, on a book, looking, I mean, looking up instead of, like, sitting at a table and pressing on it. Then he'd do that for days without leaving the room.